or I'm going to give this a whirl. Oh. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Jen Mason. And I'm going to welcome you to the Section 508 Digital Accessibility Training. Trying to get my slide up. Um, I'm an acting training coordinator for the Soil and Plant Science Division, and I have several co-producers with me today. Meredith Albers, who is the National Resource Soil Scientist for Training. Christy Wiley, a communications specialist for the Soil and Plant Science Division. Our geographer, Paul Wright. Christy and Paul normally do our field notes sessions, and I thank you for joining us with today to help Meredith and I out with this. Um, this is brought to you by a collaboration of several different focus teams, uh, the training focus team, the outreach and communications focus team, and a section 508 sub team, which was developed from both of those. Shortly, Dr. David Limbo, the director for the Soil and Plant Science Division, will open with a few remarks. He will then introduce our guest speaker for today's live event, but first a few housekeeping items. This is a Microsoft live event, not a Teams meeting, which means you're joining today's webinar in listen-only mode. We encourage you to ask questions at any time using the question and answer or the Q&A panel. The Q&A panel should open by default. However, if for some reason your Q&A panel is not open, simply click, click the question mark icon. It should be on your upper right side of your screen. Please only ask questions related to the content in today's live event. I know 508 spreads far and wide, but we will not be addressing uh, maps or very complex tables at this time. If we are not able to address all questions, we will send the PowerPoint and an FAQ document and another document with additional resources. And I will also send some AgLearn training courses to follow up with today's session. For closed captions, turn on the live caption button located in the lower right hand corner. Today's session is being recorded. The recorded session will be available on in Teams in the Training Focus Team channel and on the Soil and Plant Science Division's YouTube channel. Again, thank you for joining us this afternoon or this morning if you're in the West Coast. I hope you enjoy today's session. And with that, I'll turn it over to the Director of the Soil and Plant Science Division, Dr. David Limbo, to tell you a little more about today's webinar and introduce our guest speaker, Dave. All right, thanks, Jennifer. So and you're here to hear about Section 508. So a little background. Uh, Section 508 was enacted to eliminate barriers to information technology, open new opportunities for people with disabilities, and encourage development of technologies that will help achieve these goals. Section 508 was amended by Congress in 1998 from the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. So this has been around for a while. It's not something that's really that new. It does require all federal agencies to make their information and communication technology accessible and usable by people with disabilities. Digital accessibility is everyone's responsibility. And again, that's why you're here. That's why you're joining us. It is your responsibility. It is policy. It is law. So we need to be aware of it. As federal employees, any content you create must meet the revised Section 508 standards of the Rehabilitation Act. Given the importance of Section 508, the division has developed a 508 or Section 508 team comprised of members of the Standards Branch, the Soil Business Systems Branch, Soil Services and Information Branch, the Training Team, and the Outreach and Communications Team. This sub team has made great strides in the last uh, few months um, and has done a lot of heavy lifting. However, there are additional and hopefully easy steps that we can all take to continually ensure our content meets the letter and spirit of Section 508. To tell us about that today is Karen Garrison, who is uh, the FPAC Digital Accessibility Program Manager, and she will be sharing a variety of simple tasks with us today. Thank you, Karen, for providing the training for the uh, Soil and Plant Science Division, as well as folks here from the Resource Inventory and Assessment Division today. With that, Karen, the floor is yours and welcome. Okay, thank you, David. I appreciate the introduction and you've done my whole presentation. Um, that's a great overview of really the, the main issue or point is 
that 508 is required. Um, like you said, my name is Karen Garrison. I'm the FPAC Section 508 Program Manager, also the Digital Accessibility Program Manager. It's kind of interchangeable. The terms have kind of changed as, as the last few years. There's been a higher focus on 508. Um, and I am going to present you a lot of information. I am not going to read everything off the, the slides. Um, I just want to try to give you as much information and hopefully you'll come away with at least one or two things you remember. And then you'll have this um, PowerPoint as a resource um, for future um, questions you might have or you can reach out to me. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, like I said, David pretty much covered Section 508. Um, there's legislation behind it. I'm definitely not going to read all this to you, and I can't say I know it by heart either, but there are references here. Um, I've made um, the links here, so you can, once you have this, you can go in and look at the links if you're really interested in reading all about the law. Like I mentioned, there has been an increased focus over the last couple of administrations. This 21st Century Integrated Digital Experience Act, or IDEA, um, came in during the Trump administration. Um, it started really focusing more on trying to get our documents, our websites, everything um, compliant with the 508 laws. Then um, the, President Biden, added the Presidential Executive Order 14035. It really goes into a lot more detail about accessibility, what needs to be done, and how it needs to be done. So if you're not sure if you have to do 508, all you have to do is look through the first three pages of this and read through all these things. And this is what um, my position entails, is trying to um, create programs around what I've been given um, through the legislation to accomplish. Um, just some disability statistics, uh, just so you understand why this is so important. Um, just a few of them. 22% of the world's population has some sort of disability. I know a lot of people think of disability as something that you can see or maybe you can hear from somebody, but it's not. It's something as simple as you need glasses. That's considered a disability. And unfortunately, myself included, I, I fall under that. So, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are covered by this. Uh, we have internet access, and especially with us working from home, I'm sure some of these numbers probably need to be revised with more of us working from home. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to read through all of these, but you can see there's there's a lot of different disabilities. It's not just vision, it's intellectual, it's physical. Um, so what is an accessible doc document? It's a document created to be easily readable by a sighted reader as a low vision as as a low vision or non-sighted reader. We all have different uh, abilities of vision. Some people see perfectly and some people don't. And the more time we spend on our laptops and our computers, unfortunately, a lot of our vision is decreased. So the main focus, and you'll hear me say this a lot, is screen reader. You know, if you're using a screen reader, you have to do that, but not only blind people or vastly reduced vision people use screen readers. Um, I use screen readers sometimes when I have a hard time reading the document. So uh, you'll hear that term a lot, screen reader, and that's why. That's what we use on a document so that somebody can hear what the document is saying. Making a document accessible is easiest when it's done in the original stages of creating the document. But we are having to do that. That is part of our requirement. So it can be done, but if I can try to kind of teach you some ways to create a document from the beginning and make it more accessible, then I'm ahead of the game. Uh, to learn all the aspects of accessibility can take several hours courses. I've been doing this approximately 10 to 12 years. Um, before I started working on the 508 team, I was actually a, a programmer and I didn't even know what 508 meant. So I was right there with everybody else when I started. Uh, the top five most common accessibility issues. I had somebody from NRCS one time ask me, what is this something simple I can get out? I just want to start somewhere with my folks. So we put this one together. We talked about it a long time because there's a lot of things, but the five most common things, missing alt text. Alt text is when you add 
um, alternative text to your image. It is what the screen reader reads. So when you see a picture and you can see what's on the picture and it may, some pictures are very detailed, um, especially, you know, NRCS, I've seen that a lot with your documents. You have very detailed um, pictures in your documents, but if they don't have alt text behind them, which is explaining what's in that picture, then somebody with a screen reader or somebody has vision issues or blind cannot, they're not gaining anything from that. Um, so you need to add the alt text. Um, incorrect heading structure. Headings are really important because when you're using a screen reader, and like I said, I'm going to keep emphasizing screen reader, but this is really kind of why a lot of these rules are in place or things that we need to focus on is because it is for people with vision restrictions. Um, the heading structure is how somebody, how the tool would go through and read the document. So if you don't put in the correct structure, and things like titles, heading one, heading two, heading three. Um, there is a, it, it's kind of comes to you simply if you see it, it's like an outline structure, but the structure is how it goes through. So if, if I'm using a screen reader and I read the title of the document, okay, I know now what the document is gonna be about, or I have some idea. Then I start reading through it and I get down to heading three and oh, I forgot what was up in heading one. I can go back to that easily with commands using the screen reader. If it's not set up correctly, I may have to go to the very top of a document. And if it's a 200 page document, I'm going to have to go to the top every time and read all the way back through it to get back down to where I was. So structure, the heading structure is very, very important. Incorrect table types. Um, I know we're not going to go into complex tables today, but they're Complex tables should be avoided, and please don't, before everybody jumps on me, I know we use complex tables. Let me explain why they can be difficult. If we move, the normal progression of moving through a table is top to bottom, left to right. If you have um, a, a column that has you know, one cell, and then you've divided that into multiple cells or multiple cells in the second column, go back to the first one, the screen reader doesn't know what to do with it. They really just want a one-on-one -on -one relationship. But I also understand that we do have complex tables and we do use them. Um, like I said, we're not going to go into it today, but I've kind of got here a complex data table is one in which there are nested columns or nested rows. And that's what causes the problem. So if you can keep kind of thinking in your mind, how would a screen reader read this if it reads it? How does it know to go back to the, the previous column and read that again and then go back to the columns? So it's just kind of getting in your mind the screen reader process. That's kind of the best way that I've found that kind of gets people to understand why some of these things are so important. The lack of lists or incorrect use of lists. Lists is one of those things that we found that kind of become very confusing. People feel like if they, start putting in items and then they go back and they put a one and two and three in front of that. Oh, I've created a list. This is one, two, th one, two, three. That's actually not a list. You need to go in and use the numbered or bulleted lists that come within the tool to create um, lists. And lists are important because that kind of, the, it will read to a screen reader, it will say list, and then they'll know all these items go together. So once again, using the screen reader, it's putting items together to make it easier for someone with a screen reader. Untagged documents. Tags are kind of an interesting area. A lot of people don't, it's hard for people to understand what tags are because you don't see them. When I look at this document, I don't see the tags behind the scenes. In 508, there's kind of two things, especially with the screen reader. There's what you're seeing on the screen, and then there's the syntax behind it. And you can, there are tools that will let you see that syntax. It's almost kind of like I can correlate it to when you do the paragraph, you do the, the paragraph so you can see the paragraphs and that comes out in your document. Same thing with tags, except there's just no command that lets you see the tags right offhand. You have to go into the tool and you have to go in and, and see what the tags are. But each paragraph needs to be tagged as a paragraph or if they're tables, 
because all of those things are what is read to tell the the user what what they're looking at, even though they can't see it on the page. Um, and I know that this is so hard. I know when I started on 508, I kind of thought, I don't understand all this. Why do I have to think this way? But um, a lot of places, and we started to do this before COVID hit, we had what we called um, a lab. It was a sympathy, well, they call them sympathy labs, but we would set it up and we would blindfold somebody and then have them work through, try to work through a document by listening to the screen reader. And I think that was one of the best ways to get people to understand why we need to do all these things. Um, unfortunately, I haven't figured out a good way to do that virtually yet, but um, that really makes you understand because once you can, as you can still see, it's very hard to, to correlate why you need to do these things. Um, like it says here, without tags, the assistive technology would have to guess at the structure. And guessing is not good. Um, you know, most of the time it's not going to be accurate. So going into some of the basic principles and some of these things you're going to hear over and over again, because I, I we kind of do that to emphasize how important some of them are. But some of the, the first one I've got here, document properties. I don't think a lot of people, I'm always surprised how many people don't know that there are document properties. Um, when you go into a document, there are things that are added automatically. Um, some of you, and if, if, you, if you know, I guess this is a good point to say this. I am not trying to make it sound like any of you are not knowledgeable about creating documents. So please don't feel offended if it sounds like I the the uh, information I'm providing is kind of below what you already know, but that you'd be surprised how many people do not know these things. So I start with the basic document properties. It's where the title is, the author, the key search word, the key search words, language and subject matter. And even the language is important to set sometimes. Um, we have found that sometimes some documents, depending on if they come from an outside source, they were actually created with another language depending on who created them for that company. So a lot of times with contractors, if they work for a company, they are actually changing the language on documents constantly. And sometimes those things don't get set, correct, set correctly. So for document properties, you go out to the file and then you'll see the info. And you just go in and you add that information because this is what's read to this. This is what the screen reader will read to the person using it. It will tell them who created the document. So now they know who, the, who to go back to if they have an issue or a question. It will tell them the title of the document. And those are all things that really should be done for every document. I mean, that's, that's just a, kind of a standard. Adding alt text to images, um, pictures, clip arts, charts, tables, everything, everything like that has alt text because once again, I'm, I think of it as being blindfolded and looking at this document and having maybe the, my documents not have a lot of pictures in them, but pictures in there that explain maybe what a certain field looks like or how to, you know, do some sort of process. If there's no description behind that picture, when the screen reader comes to the picture, it will just say image and then it'll go on. So they will have lost any sort of of information they would have gained through that picture. So in most cases, you can right click on the object and you can add it. Um, I was looking the other day at somebody sent me an email and I happened to, it happened to come up with a, an accessibility error and I looked and their little, they had a little clip art of the um, agency that they worked for and it didn't have alt text behind it. So if I had not been able to see that, I wouldn't have known what agency they were for because it wouldn't have read it. So alt text is just, if one thing, if you come away today with one thing, alt text, please do alt text. It is so important. Um, using styles in long documents. Um, use the program's built-in or custom style menus to create titles, headings, lists, and paragraphs. Once again, that's how the screen reader reads things. Um, it's important to use that and do the, numer the numerical order. When creating lists, use only round bullets as very few fancier bullets are recognizable or read by today's screen readers. Please remember when you read some of this, I'm saying these are best practices. 
Um, I'm not telling you you cannot use a square. I have squares in my document here. I'm just saying these are best practices. If you can stay away from using other the other styles in the list, please do. But I'm not telling you, please don't come back and say, Karen said I cannot use these. Um, that is not the intent behind this information. Um, specify column header rows and tables. Designing tables with as simple a structure of rows and columns as possible and specify which row is your column header or row title. Um, that's important. I, I've worked with people um, in different areas and they come in and they're working on an older document and they've got these really complex tables and we you can either spend a lot of time trying to fix the complex table or you can redesign it and break it down and a lot of times people choose to break it down. Complex tables for some reason the 508 world and the tools or whatever you're doing whatever you're using to create it with have still not really developed good processes for using um, complex tables. But like I said, I'm not telling you you can't use them. They can be made compliant. It is just much more work intensive to get them to that point. Um, using meaningful hyperlinks. Um, hyperlinks are really interesting. When you have a screen reader, if you do not um, go in and create a meaningful hyperlink, um, it reads every single if you have a URL, it will read every single character in that URL to somebody with a screen reader. So it, this is once again, it's a best practice. It is nice to instead of seeing the URL, if you go in and do the edit and create the line, you put a description that describes what the URL is. Um, for instance, if you're going to um, a screen to create a document, you know, putting what that what that screen is and what the document is that you're going to, it's going to read much shorter than going through that whole URL. So that's a, once again, it's a best it's a best practice. Um, so what we're saying is, do not use the URL in the text field. Once again, I'm not telling you you can't. You can. That does not break any compliance rules but it is much easier and much cleaner to follow for somebody who has a screen reader. Avoid using blank cells for formatting or paragraph marks for spacing between lines of paragraphs. I was probably one of the, the worst people about this. Oh, I need 10 spaces. Okay, I'm gonna hit enter 10 times. Um, every one of those reads to a screen reader, it says, it, Different screen readers will say different words, but it can say return, it can say space, space, space. And like it says here, sometimes it can even um, it can even kind of confuse the screen reader and it can kind of get caught in a loop and it'll just keep reading those and it'll have a hard time getting out of that. Um, it can be annoying to a listener. It's not annoying to you because you can see the screen. But once again, we're trying to trying to do some best practices. Um, include closed captions for all audio files. Um, definitely, this is important. Accessibility is important to individuals with low or no hearing ability. Um, so therefore, include include closed captions for all audio files in the document or presentation. We're really starting to see some new tool development around audio files and making it a lot easier to use these in your documents and making them um, compliant in the past. This has kind of been a, a rough area of how you would deal with um, some of these audio files, but it is getting much better. They're making, they're actually making the audio files more compliant, so that's good. And utilize access accessibility check tools in the newer versions of programs. If you're in a document, and this is true, and you'll see it further down in the in this um, presentation, um, always look under the review tab. There's almost every tool now has an accessibility checker. I will only caution you about this because I know that we've had a lot of feedback about this, and I understand. The accessibility checker only checks for, I believe in Word, it only checks 30, around 30 rules. When I run a checker with the tool that I use, it checks for approximately 85 rules. 
So as you can see, I if you do a document, you use the accessibility checker, it comes out and says there's no issues. Um, and then I and then I run it for some reason. You ask me to run it or we're do, working on it and I run using my tool. I'm maybe going to find some errors that you didn't find when you ran your accessibility checker. So that's my only warning against those is the accessibility checkers are really basic. They do not check for as many rules. Um, basic. I'm sorry, did I skip ahead? No. Um, basic principles of accessible documents headings. OK, so this is going in a little bit more detail about the headings because I've worked with some people recently and, and it, this was kind of a hard concept for them to get. Um, it's just I understand that I've worked with it so long. It probably doesn't seem like that to me, but I understand sometimes. So using good heading structure helps people with eyesight to understand how the document is organized. I mean, without eyesight, I'm sorry. Pages should be structured um, in this manner. Think of headings in terms of an outline. So heading one is your main page title. It's the most important heading. Um, there should really just be one. But once again, that's the best practice. Heading one is normally in the largest font in the document. Every document should have a title. Some people, especially with PowerPoints, um, they have a title on each page. And that's kind of sometimes based on the structure. If you use a template, like in this PowerPoint that I'm using right now, where it says basic principles of accessible documents headings, that's a title. It's, it's based on the, for, on the um, template that I've used it's kind of set for me, but if you have your own document and you've created it, you should have at least one title. If you want to title each page because it's different, I'm not saying put your title on each page of the same name. I'm just saying if you have kind of a document and it, it's kind of hard to, to visualize this, I understand, but some documents I've worked on, it's kind of like each page kind of starts a new section or a new thing. That is up to you, but you've got to be consistent and you've got to make sure that you have this heading one. And when we were talking about tags, what a heading one will look like is an H1 tag. You have to have an H1 tag. If you do not, you will get an error because if you went on and created um, heading twos and you didn't create a heading one, it skips that, that's an error. It doesn't know how to go to H2 if you don't have an H1 first. Um, so it, like I said, it's the largest font in the document. Once you, if you use the um, settings in your Word documents to create your headings, you just, the styles, you can go in and edit those. Um, you don't have to keep what the big size might be that comes in. You can edit that, but it, you need to make sure that it gets that tag, which you're not going to see. That's going to come up when you, when you test the document. That's going to be that behind the scenes syntax that's read. Heading two is a major section heading smaller than heading one. So you just kind of think about it. It's going to keep working its way down. Heading three is a subsection of heading two um, and so on. So you can kind of see you need to kind of keep moving them down. Don't skip. You can't you can't use a heading four and then go to a heading two and then go to a heading four and you've got to kind of keep that order. And um, then the last statement word supports headings one through nine. If you go in, you will see if you select and you use the styles, each time you choose one of the H headings, it will add another one. It will go up to nine. I don't usually see many documents that go be above a three, maybe four at the most. Um, you could you could really go crazy, I guess, and really divide it down. Um, that's up to you. That's up to you. But just to let you know that in Word, you can only go down to nine and PDFs are different. They don't support as many headings. Um, once again, lists, kind of a little more detail about lists. Um, they should be used, created using Word built in tools for ordered, numbered, and unordered bulleted lists. If you don't use these tools, the list is not really a list. And I know that sounds silly, but it it, it is a list visually if you look at it, but it's not for the syntax and it will not be understood by a screen reader. Creating lists manually by hitting the tab key, tab key to indent content, that does not create a list. Um, there are two types of lists used in Word, bullets and numbers. 
And like I said, I, I'm not going to discourage you from using some of the other shapes that are out there and different things. It's not against the rules. But once again, we're trying to do the best practices for what are easier, are easier for people to read. And that includes people with sight. I don't know how many documents I've looked at and I couldn't figure out whether it was a square or what it was. Um, I guess it wasn't it didn't change the value of the document to me, but it just it kind of was hard. I don't like it when I can't understand what they're trying to structure and how they're trying to structure it. Um, use tables wisely. Tables can be very difficult for screen readers, users to understand unless they include markup that explicitly defines the relationships between all the parts, headers, data cells. For a simple table with one row of column headers and no nested rows or columns, Word is the best place to create the tables. Now, once again, this is just advice. I'm not trying to change your whole lifestyle. If you've created them a certain way and they work and they're compliant, that's great. This is just from experience and kind of from best practices, um, from different different areas of information. Um, more complex tables should be made accessible within HTML or Adobe PDF. Um, this is definitely kind of an experience I've had um, with complex tables. It's very hard to work in Adobe. Some people have had a lot of experience with it and they can and correct them and they can fix them in Adobe very well. For newer people that I work with a lot of times, it's very hard for them to work in Adobe PDF um, for complex tables. Um, like I said here, this is just a piece of a uh, best practice. Often um, they can be simplified by breaking them into multiple simple tables. Um, for simple tables, the only step necessary for accessibility is to identify the rows and contains the column headers. Templates for Word, Excel, and PowerPoint documents. Microsoft offers um, compliant templates that can be accessed in two different ways. And when I'm using the word compliant, that means 508 compliant. Um, the first way is to open a new document in the format that you want for your document, such as Word, Excel, or PowerPoint. Go to the file, then select New. Um, I believe the way it works now is they just they pop up at that point, and you can choose various types of templates, or you can use the search box to choose or to search for templates. The second way is, and I've, I this was kind of new information for me, so I added it onto this um, slide, but you can go to templates.office.com and select the format you want to use, and it will bring up several different options. And you do, this is actually one of the things where we have permission to actually download those templates. You know, a lot of times you go in to do something and you want to download it and you get the security issue. Not, not in this case. They do let you through to be able to download these. So. It's kind of a handy point. Ah, just some basic things about accessible Word documents. Use simple language. Communicate with your audience in a way that they can understand the first time they read or hear it. Um, I, there's kind of really been a big movement recently for simple language. Um, it's, it's using, it's trying to explain um, technical words in ways that you know, the basic person can understand just by reading it. Because if you think about it in a screen reader, think about once again, not being able to see the document and having something read to you. Um, if you don't have a screen reader, uh, if you've not used the screen reader software before, um, we do have NVDA, which is available to us through the software. It is a certified um, software. It's a free screen reader. I guess I would kind of suggest that you go out and you you get the NVDA. I believe you do have to put in a ticket to get it, but it is a approved software and just try it. Um, I remember when I first started on the team, most people had JAWS and probably some of you have heard of JAWS. Um, JAWS was the, the prominent screen reader at the time. And I would hear this voice coming from over the wall from one of my team members. And I would think, oh my goodness. I mean, it was just a monotonous tone of listening to it. And I used to think, oh, just, 
I'm never going to get used to it. It doesn't bother me as much now. And actually with some of the newer screen readers like NVDA, you can actually kind of change their voices. You can even choose accents. Um, so it's not as bad as it used to be, but I can remember people yelling at us saying, put on your headphones. We don't want to hear that noise because it just was a very monotonous name. Then I had a team member um, that was blind and it just kind of opened a whole new world and how she could use it. Um, the screen reader and how she had to use it. I mean, she when she logged on in the morning, it came up and it started reading everything to her. I mean, that was the only way she could accomplish her job. And um, so it kind of gave me a different background of, or a different thought process of using screen reader and different things about accessibility. Um, but yeah, if you, if you want to, you're free to have that software and it is actually good. Um, I believe in Adobe, I think they still have the Adobe version where it has the read it to me. Um, that one's a little bit different and can be a little bit tougher to use and sometimes will lock up your documents. So I don't always advise that one, but NVD is available to anybody. Um, ensure that font size is sufficient. There is no standard that says you have to use a certain size. These are suggestions, um, a minimum of 11 points. Because if you start going below 11, boy, things get tough. And I don't even think I ever use 11 anymore. And uh, But 14 points is kind of the standard. It is not a required standard. Nobody is going to go through and check to see what size um, fonts you're using. But it is definitely a better, a better option. Use the most accessible fonts. These are just a list of once again, best practices. These are good ones to use. They are not the only ones. There is no, there's no tool that will go through and say, oh, you're not using one of these fonts. Um, your document doesn't pass um, compliancy. Um, these are just suggestions. Provide sufficient contrast between text colors and background colors. This is one of the one things that we have a lot of difficulty with. Um, especially with some of the templates I've found, with, especially with the PowerPoint templates. I, I'm not quite sure how they were created or who created them, but some of the coloring is really tough. Um, I had one document come in to me from, I can't even remember the group it came to me from, but it was a one-page flyer. And at the top, they had really dark background colors, and then they let it get lighter as the page went down. Um, so when I tested it, when I tested one part of the document, it passed. And then when I went down and kept testing because the color had changed, it didn't pass at the bottom. There are standards um, that you do have to meet um, on the color contrast. And the tools will tell you that. Um, you can also go out to WALCAG, um, which is what our standards are, what our standards are based on for all our testing rules. Um, and it will show you what those those numbers need to be. Um, but there are tools, definitely tools that are, are great now. The tools for color contrast are much better than they used to be. You can actually, some of them you can actually go in and change. You can use a slide and it will actually let you change the color on the document with the slide until it becomes accessible, which is so much better than the old ways used to be. Um, do not use color as the only way to convey information. This one has been kind of tough for some people to kind of get out of using um, that mode. They highlight things. We all do that. I've done that. I still do that. Um, and I know that that is not the best practice because if I can't see color, and once again, we're, we're getting away from somebody being blind to somebody having color, um, being colorblind. And that's a lot of people. That's a large number. If you're using something, you may not think about it because you're seeing the highlight, but you need to kind of emphasize it in another way. Um, you can use color, you can make it bold, um, but once again, you've got to keep thinking about the vision. Would I be able to see this if I was blind? How is it going to, because our screen reader is not going to be able to tell you those things with color. It's not going to say a red, red word and then read the word to you. It's not, it doesn't do that. So please try not to do that. If you do have to use color, please also then add a description in some way. 
Um, it's kind of hard to give you examples of all of these situations, but if you think about it, sometime when you've used color as the only way to convey information, like uh, a simple thing on a lot of um, uh, websites, press the red button or put a check mark in the blue box or put a this and that color, you also have to have another way for that person who cannot see that color to be able to to complete that action. Um, be careful with the use of watermarks. I don't see that a lot anymore, but people still do watermarks. They can impact readability and create low contrast. Anytime you put something on top of something else, it, a screen reader doesn't know which one to read. It's kind of like piling two pieces of paper on top of each other and saying, OK, tell me what's on the bottom piece. It's the same kind of concept. Um, provide a table of contents for long documents. That is definitely nice for um, screen readers. They can definitely uh, manipulate through a um, table of contents a lot easier. Use cut and paste as little as possible. If you think about this, why would I not use cut and paste? Boy, that's simple. I lived my whole life when I first started with the government 30 years ago with cut and paste. The problem is when you cut something, you take all of that, that hidden code behind it and you take it with you. So first of all, one of the issues you're going to have is you're going to have to go out and correct that because if it wasn't compliant when that doc, whenever that original um, item was created, then you've just brought the bad code with you into another document. The other thing is, depending on what you've cut and what you've pasted, sometimes you cannot make it compliant. You can't change it in such a way to make it compliant. Um, there's just some of the older versions of Word, and I and we're starting to see this more, I know, because a lot of areas are starting to get back. And I know I've worked on some projects in NRCS with some documents that were very old um, and trying to get some of those compliant, especially things that come in from the outside, um, non-government type things where they've submitted a document to you or they've submitted a proposal. Um, some of those documents trying to get those compliant is very, very time consuming or they just have to be recreated. Um, so that's that's kind of important. Don't use the cut and paste and please never don't use scanned information. You cannot edit a scan piece of information. There's no way to do it. It comes in and it's just, it is just what it is. And I've seen that some on documents. I know they've probably used one piece of information in multiple documents. Somebody scanned it in. Um, you know, that's that's a problem with scanning. Scanning is the world where we still can't make it compliant yet. So please, please don't do that. And then once again, check accessibility tools. There's a check accessibility tool in your Word. There is one. Actually, in your email, if you're creating a new email, if you go up and look under review, there's an check accessibility. Please use that. If I can't get you to do anything else, just do that. That will definitely, you know, make your emails accessible. It will make your documents more accessible. Maybe they may still need some more work, but you're going to be ahead of the game because you've already resolved some of the issues, or maybe you didn't have any issues. And you're doing it right. That's good. It's a confirmation that you're creating your documents correctly. So please use the check accessibility. Um, accessible PDF documents. Document tags must follow the visual and logical order of the document. Once again, we're talking about this um, information that's behind the document, if you want to think of it that way. Um, Tags are created in a variety of ways, um, especially with some of the older documents. It's kind of hard because depending on what version of a, a tool they were created on, some of them did not have the accessibility like they do now. Um, if you create a Word document and you and then you want to make a PDF out of it, it adds that tagging when you create the PDF. Um, there are ways to add tagging to older PDF documents, and we'll kind of talk about that, but um, that's what tags are. Tags are what tells you the order, and that's what you read. Um, reading orders should be manually checked on PDF documents. It's one of the things that the tools do not check. 
Um, they really don't know if they're reading the, the order correctly. So if you've created your document and somehow you've you've created it where you start at the top and you're reading through and then all of a sudden you jump down to the, the page number and then you come back up, that reading order is not correct. A lot of times you can simply check that just by tabbing, doing manual tabbing on your screen. Tab, tab and see where your tab, where the, where the mouse goes, where the marker goes. If you tab through your document and it jumps all over the place, then your, your, tag, your order is incorrect because that's exactly how the screen reader is going to read it. And that's another way you can do tests is manual testing. Um, when creating a PDF from a Word document, use the Save as Adobe PDF option under File. Do not use the Save as option and change the file type to PDF. I did this for years and years and years. We have found now, as we've worked on documents longer, that unfortunately sometimes that syntax is not created or the tags or syntax is not created correctly when you do that. If you actually go through the option to save as a DOP PDF, it adds all of that behind the scenes and it adds it correctly. If you need a Word version of the PDF document, use the export PDF under tools and then create and edit to create the Word document. Um, just anytime you're just going to go in and save it as and change the type, the file type, there's a chance it's going to, it's going to, mess up your document um, so yeah it, and it's simple it's not going to change I, some people said well oh, no if i export it it does different things no it doesn't it's just going to take it down it's just going to take your pdf and create the word and it's going to add all that tagging behind the scenes and it's going to be correct whenever possible go back to the authoring document to correct errors in the pdf document if the authoring document is available to you um, sometimes people, uh, I'm seeing a lot more too when there's more focus now with getting documents, older documents compliant. Um, they don't have the initial Word document. Um, so we we do this thing with the export. We export the, the PDF down to a Word. And sometimes all we do is just bring it and then create a new PDF. We don't do anything. We don't change anything. We don't do any editing, but just by having it go through that process, it adds all that tagging behind the scenes and it adds it correctly um, because a lot of documents we're seeing are you know, five or six years old. Well, how many different versions of tools have we had since then? So that will kind of get it back up to date. Um, if working with a PDF document that is not tagged, the best practice is to export, and that's what I was just talking about, is export that PDF to a Word document, save it, and then do save as Adobe and bring it back into PDF. That should correct most, I would say 90% of the time, and that will correct your tagging or any other syntax issues you're having. Um, use the Adobe Accessibility Checker. Once again, there is a checker, um, and I give you the path of how to do it to go to the accessibility check. Um, the PDF, it has a very, Adobe has a very strong PDF uh, checker. We actually, our team actually has licenses for a, a tool called Common Look PDF. Um, but Adobe is kind of the, the standard if you're not purchasing licenses. And we can, we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. Um, but we actually have a couple tools we use. But Adobe is, I use Adobe. I kind of flip back and forth um, with more experience that I've gained. I've kind of learned sometimes when I know a document's going to be really bad, I'll, I'll use my tool. And, and, and if I think it's not going to be too bad, I use Adobe. Um, I think department um, standard is kind of the Adobe because they don't have a separate license tool that they're using. Um, Excel documents. Uh, I know Excels are, are tougher. They are much tougher. Um, they are getting better. They're trying to, I think every time uh, Microsoft comes out with a newer version, they do a little bit more towards the accessibility. Um, some, just some other hints. Make sure you have text in cell A1. That's where screen readers start reading from cell A1. Um, I think they actually kind of suggest to put your title in A1. I don't give that advice because I know that doesn't really fit with our standards a lot of times. But if you if you can do that, if you can use A1 for your title of what your Excel spreadsheet is, that's great. 
Um, give all worksheets unique names and remove blank worksheets. Once again, if I can't see what the name is on the worksheet and they all say page one or page two or page three, that, that doesn't help me if I can't see it. Um, name cells and ranges so that screen readers, users can quickly identify the purpose of cells and ranges in Excel worksheets. Images, charts, and graphics included in a worksheet need to have alternate text. As you will see, once again, all that alt text is right back there. Hyperlink text should provide a clear description of the link destination rather than pro providing the URL. And that's what we were talking about on the Word document. You'll see a lot of these rules or, or suggestions, best practices, cover all the documents. They're not just one. There's not a set of rules for Excels and PowerPoints. And there's some things that are specific to those, but they're, most of them, like alt text, list, all those kind of things. The five things that I said were the top ones, those are going to follow through through all your document types. Avoid blank cells, rows, and columns. When navigating by keyboard, a blank row, column, or cell with an Excel might lead someone to believe that there's nothing more in the table. If I can't see the table and I'm using my screen reader and it says blank, and maybe you've got three blanks in a row, I'm going to think, oh, okay, we're done with this. And maybe just close out the document. I won't even try to read on. Um, if you're just a suggestion, if they're not on the edges of the table, so if you're not at the end of your table, and you know, if you've got one blank spot and one blank cell and then you're, the table's done, then I wouldn't worry about it. But if you've got several, I, you know, put something in there that explains, you know, I, I've left this blank. You know, maybe somebody's going to go in later and fill in the data. Maybe you've made columns for 2023, 2024. Well, Nothing's going to be filled in in 24 at this point. You might just, you know, make a comment in there like that. And then once again, in Excel, there's an accessibility tool. The check accessibility tools are actually pretty good. I mean, they don't just say, oh, here's an error. They give you a solution on how to fix it, or they give you more information of where to look for um, information. So they're actually pretty good in that base. But like I said, they just don't cover all the rules. Um, PowerPoints, uh, be cautious about using preset slide layouts or templates. A lot of the preset slide layouts are, I am going to have to, I made a, an error on that, sorry, are very bust and will not pass color contrast tests. Um, I'm going to have to look up what that word is supposed to be. I did, I changed something, sorry. Um, what the problem is, is the color contrasting a lot of times. Um, we see with the PowerPoints especially, they've tried to make them very colorful and maybe, you know, half the screen is one color, half the screen is another color. Or, um, a lot of problems is, is with the color, with the using the preset slides. Sometimes it's actually, if it's a preset slide that gives you specific text boxes, um, that can be a problem too. Um, like the next one, be careful when adding text boxes. If the reading order of those text boxes is not correct, then your document will not logically read, be read by a screen reader. So I've seen this happen a lot and I've probably done it myself too. Um, I've gone in and created one and then I, oh, I want to add another box. Okay, let's add another box here. The only problem was I didn't go back to look at what my order was. So I may jump down to, I may read the title of that slide, I may read the first box, and then I may go down and read the, the um, page number, and then go back up and read. That's not the logical order. So you have to be really careful when you add text boxes to go back and check to see what the logical order is. Most slide layouts include a slide title, usually at the top of the slide, and one or more placeholder areas where you add the content. We've probably all seen that if you've created a PowerPoint. Um, content like lists, images, and tables to each slide. The title will be presented as a heading to screen readers and should be descriptive because it will be the first thing read on each slide. Um, I guess the only thing I would say is it says title. That doesn't necessarily mean, so like on this page, I guess 
title is accessible PowerPoint documents. I know a lot of people like they think of title as what the title of your whole document is, but what they're referring to is the title on that page. Um, alt text is required once again for any image in the PowerPoint. Um, there are some pictures that you will see and I'll have one at the end of my slide that don't add value. That's kind of the way they they suggest that you think about it. If I have a picture and we all do it, we've added pictures of fields or pictures of cows or pictures of, you know, beans growing in the field. If that doesn't add value to the, the presentation, it does add value if you can see the presentation, but for somebody who's using a screen reader, it doesn't. So for the screen reader, you're going to go in and you're going to mark the alt text that it, you're not going to add alt text to it. I'm sorry. You're going to mark it as um, there's a different terminology that's used. Sometimes it's um, uh, just um, I, I'm trying to think of even the words right now, uh, what it's saying. Um, you'll see it when it brings up the box to put alt text in. It'll say decorative or not required. Um, different tools and different different things use different terminology, but it'll make it sound like it's not a required thing and you don't have to add alt text. Um, that's your decision to make when you're creating a document or you're working on a document. If it adds value, then do it. Some people put alt text in every single field. If it's a picture of a field with green grass, they're going to say a green grass field. Um, that's up to you. Um, alt text going back to older documents can be really very time consuming. So a lot of times we just mark them as decorative if they don't add a value. Um, that is not to take away from anybody's um, creation when they created it because I know one person I worked on a document with and they were very offended when I marked something decorative. Um, it's it's just the way it is, but think of it as the screen reader, not the visual person looking at your slide, but a screen reader reading it. Um, and once again, use the um, check accessibility tool. Oh, I skipped one and this one is important. Alt text is alt text is required for any image in the PowerPoint. Do not select, if you have the option, do not select the um, create the description for me button. And the best way I can describe this was, I remember when the cameras first started coming out with some of the new software for um, people with visual, um, visual issues, it had um, software where you could point it at something and it would identify it for you. Now, we all know this has come a long way since these first came out, but this was one of the first uh, first phones I had seen with this. It was one of the people on our team. He pointed it at a um, cabinet, a filing cabinet, and it said it was a refrigerator. And I thought, boy, would I be disappointed when I went up to it thinking, oh, I'm gonna get my drink out of this thing and it's a filing cabinet. Same thing with this. If you use the button, you hit the button that acts a, a description for you, it's not going to be accurate. 98% of the time, it will not be accurate. So please don't take the easy way. It was kind of a button. I don't know who created it, and most 508 coordinators like myself hate that button um, to create it, to generate it. It is very poor. It is not descriptive. If you go back, if you try it one time and you go back, you'll see it is not. Um, it is not a good description. Um, so accessibility testing. Accessibility testing includes reviewing your website, applications, and your digital content, your documents against common standards, and evaluating usability for people who use assistive technologies such as screen readers. The goal of accessibility testing is to capture this information, make improvements, and meet the government digital initiatives. Um, our testing standards are based on, like I said, WALCAG 2. Point, actually, 2.2 is getting ready to come out. Um, you'll hear anything from 2.0, 2.1, 2.2. The nice thing is now when they add new ones, um, new versions, they just kind of created it as an add-on instead of redoing the whole um, document, which is great. So if I say it's 2.2, then that includes everything all the way up through 2.0, 2.1, 2.2. Um, I think the first five, six years I was on the team, there were no 
um, upgrades. That's how quickly the world is changing in this arena is that they just really are updating these things much quicker. So there's two types of testing. There's automated and manual. Um, we use, we kind of use, we use, FPAC is fortunate. We are the only agency under, or the only missionary under USDA that has automated tools. Everybody else, including the department level, um, even though they're trying to work on a process of getting a tool set in place, um, which will take probably a while. We've been working on it for two, three years now, and it's still not happened. So um, we just happened to be lucky, get some money at the time, and said, can we try these tools? And we've been able to keep them. But um, automated tools will not catch everything. Um, they cannot do uh, tools that, general tools that that check everything a lot of times don't do the color contrast very well. You need a separate tool that's focused on that. I can't tell you why. The only thing I can think of is that these companies have kind of tried to keep their niche. The ones that have developed color contrast tools don't really want their tools to be part of the other ones because then they don't have a business. Um, so we catch about 80 to 90% now. When I first started, it was more in the 67, 60 to 70% range of what they would catch. So that's why we had to still do manual testing too, is to catch those other things. So we, we still keep that standard and it's really based on what the department 508 team has, has told us that we need to follow. Um, so we do, like I said, the manual testing, which is consists of using the keyboard. Um, if you, if all of a sudden you couldn't use, you know, different things and you had to use your keyboard only, you know, would it still work? Um, and so we do that and then we use the screen reader. And between those three things, we catch, we catch it all. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, we do ask that people that are developing anything, documents, you're doing your own testing at your point, especially with websites, but with documents also. The more that you get worked out, the less issues there's going to be later on um, when maybe somebody else is using it, or if even it is published and somebody, you know, in the public tries to use it and then it doesn't work. So we've really got to keep trying to get more and more of those issues worked out. Um, manual accessibility testing, like it says, it's the process of ex in expecting it um, by hand. I know that sounds kind of funny because you're not really doing it by hand, but it is doing it differently. Um, I kind of learned this process a little bit more from the department because, like I said, this is how they still test everything. Um, examples of manual testing include testing your app or website with a screen reader, turning off speakers and microphones to make sure that the website um, is still is still working, navigating a website or app with only a keyboard. Um, a lot of times I don't, I have to look up the keyboard commands. I used to know them, um, but I don't know them anymore. But you know, you just kind of have to kind of work through it that way. Um, links, if you have links in your documents, please make sure that they are compliant. It will not pass compliancy testing if, and I know this is, I know this is kind of hard for everybody. We were having a dis discussion yesterday with somebody. If you link to something and it's not compliant, you need to, you need to resolve that issue. You're not going to be able to go out and fix, whether it's another website or whatever it is, but you've got to figure out a way to make that compliant um, based on how you're accessing it. So it might be something where you're accessing it but if somebody needs assistance, then they're going to have to reach out to whoever that owner is of that site. Or if it's somebody still within your own group, then you're going to need to go to them and say, you know, this doesn't work. A lot of times with links, it's a broken link. Maybe it's an old link that somebody has continued to use, but they've never really checked it. You need to check those. Um, I know one of the groups that does do, they run a tool called Site Improve against um, links. And that is one of the biggest issues we have with some of our websites is broken links. They just haven't been updated. Um, somebody created something a while back and then they just, you know, somebody else changed where their website is or the name of it. And all of a sudden um, you can't connect to that anymore. Um, automated accessibility testing. Like I was saying, there's, 
that we have tools for it. There are tools that come with a lot of the features like Word. You have the accessibility checker. Almost everything has an accessibility checker, um, but like I've told you, it's kind of a basic checker. So if you're using another automated tool, you're probably going to find some more issues um, that you didn't find. Um, yeah, I think that's we've kind of gone over a lot of this now. I've repeated myself. I've heard myself repeating myself. Um, the automated testing tools you utilized by FPAC, and this is these are available to anybody in FPAC. Um, they were originally purchased before we were organized, <laughs> reorganized into FPAC. Um, we had them under FSA and they've now rolled over into FPAC. Um, but we have um, Common Look Office which tests and remediates accessibility issues in the source file and can create PDF documents from Word or PowerPoint documents. And then Common Look PDF um, tests and remediates PDF documents. Um, I will tell you as we go look at the automated tools, there's no tool out there that's perfect there. And I've, I don't know how many times I've heard this. What tool can I just get and I just push a button and it fixes it? There's not one. I'm sorry. A lot of tools get close to that, but they don't. There's none that just fix every single issue. There, there just isn't one. Um, I think eventually maybe we'll get to that. Maybe as artificial intelligence continues to develop in the the uh, um, 508 area and companies develop more tools like that, maybe it will eventually get to that point. But right now there's not. So even if I use Common Look Office, I'm still going to have to go in and do some work to correct some of the issues. Common Look PDF, even with that one, a lot of a lot of both of these tools for documents, you can correct some of the issues within. Some of them you still have to go back out of. Um, they just they're just not to that point yet, but they are much better than what we had before. Um, X Expert, X Monitor, or are more for the websites. Um, they test systems, and web applications, and then the X monitor scans um, and reports on the accessibility status of your website. Anything with a URL, we can add that to X monitor and let it run. I actually run X monitor on um, uh, four or five different sites um, and I run it every night. And it's kind of what we use to see how things are progressing, um, how people are making things more compliant, um, because we are expected to reply um, to provide this information to OMB, um, Department of Justice. Um, everybody's interested in 508. And actually, OMB has started tying some of their um, 508 programs and advancements, how we're doing on making our things more compliant into funding for projects. Um, so it is, it's very important. You know, the more we can do, I am pleased to say that I do see advancements. Actually, I think NRCS is doing one of the best jobs. I think they had the greatest increase of um, compliancy. Um, I have to do reports twice a year to OMB and I report on all those things and NRCS is doing a great job. Um, the other agencies are a little bit further down, um, so I definitely need to spend more time working with them, but NRCS is doing a great job and they are, I am seeing documents come in that have maybe a couple little issues to no issues, which um, is almost unheard of. Um, when I first started, we never received anything that didn't have a lot of issues. So um, it's great to see so much emphasis on that. Um, the last two tools are good. Um, the NVDA or JAWS, like I said, those are screen reader softwares. Um, JAWS licenses kind of changed. We used to purchase JAWS licenses for everybody. Um, then I think the prices kind of started going up and acquisitions kind of changed their processing. So now I actually have 10 licenses, but mine are reserved for um, reasonable accommodations or 504. Some people have heard of Section 504. It is more the reasonable accommodation side. Um, so we are now saying, you know, NVDA, we've got it certified um, by CEC, so it's a free screen reader. And then the color contrast analyzer is also a free tool. 
there are some free tools out there. Some of these other ones are definitely not free and the prices are going up on some of these other tools. But every year there's more new tools and some of them are free. Um, we, we're seeing more and more free tools, which is nice. Um, accessibility training resources. There are tons of resources. If you have an issue, you get an error. If you just go out to um, Chrome or Google or, or wherever, however you do your searching and you put in that error and hit return, you're going to get resources. Um, there is so much more emphasis on 508, not only with the government, but with, but with private industry too. Um, we're seeing a lot more lawsuits. And I think that's probably why um, they're finally trying to understand that if you go out to use somebody's website or you go out to get a document and fill it in and you can't do it, then you're just going to walk away from it. And so the private industry has also started to focus on 508 um, a lot stronger and a lot more emphasis on it. So there's a lot of resources. Um, we have an FPAC Section 508 calendar of events. I will be honest with you. Um, my team is me right now. Over the last year, I've, I've had, <laughs> unfortunately, some people that have been detailed that I've lost. I've had people that um, have taken different jobs, promotions. Um, I unfortunately lost um, a member to COVID. And so it's just me right now. So my calendar is not as up to date as it should should be but if there's something you're really interested in if you just do a search on it um, you will find events all the all the tool companies have free events um, axcon there's an axcon event coming up that's a two-day free virtual um, event which is great they have a lot of good sessions um, there's a lot more and and actually COVID kind of helped that because so many of them went to virtual instead of having to show up in person that a lot of them have stayed with the virtual um, uh, training that it's kind of nice because we have more opportunities because it's kind of hard there's you don't always have money to travel everywhere to go to these events um, we do have a tool we do have licenses for something called dq university um, it is an extensive curriculum it's self-guided online courses there's a lot about documents um, kind of how that came to be is dq is the one that um, provides the axe tools that we use and this was another kind of add-on and we sat down with them and said okay let's look at your all your classes you offer and let's pick out things that'll be very central to mostly primarily documents to be honest and they're good training classes you take them at your own pace um, if you're interested just let me know and I will get you signed up I'm now the administrator for the DQ University for our licenses um, there's also um, a lot of courses and um, Jen brought that up about AgLearn there is a lot out in AgLearn um, and I think we're going to kind of take a look at those and kind of try to give you some direction because when you get the big long list it's kind of like where do I go from here so um, we'll definitely be giving you some more direction on that um, if you have any questions, need any assistance, um, I do a little bit of everything. I love doing training like this because really for me, it's a benefit because the more you know about it and the more you do make your documents and your websites compliant, then the easier my job gets. But if you need assistance, you need one-on-one -on -one training, you need whatever you need, any question, um, please send an email to this mailbox. This is the shared mailbox and it's also my mailbox for now until I get more team members um, and I you'll get an email back that says we received it and we'll get back to you and um, uh, it's a good way to communicate with our team there's also one for the department level um, and you can use that one too we do have a confluence site once again this is unfortunately is something that started to be redesigned one of, by one of the team members that has left so it, the information is probably all still, I'm going to say probably all still good. I have not had a chance to go through every single piece of it. The important pieces are all up to date. We do try to keep that up to date, but until I get another team member in that can spend time on it, I can't guarantee that it's all just um, the newest information. And then there are lots of additional resources. US Access Board is a good one. They do a lot of training. Um, 
the World Wide Web Consortium is actually that. I mean, it's everybody coming together for 508 and standards, and they are the ones that create the WCAG changes. Um, GSA has a great um, website. They have a large team that works on it. They have a Section 508 website that has a lot of information. Um, they also have something called the Trusted Tester Certification. Um, you might hear about that. I know there's more talk about that. Um, it's a good thing to take, not necessarily to get the certification, but to get the basis for for creating your, your documents, creating your websites, and then how to test them. It just gives you a good foundation. And then, of course, I got my calendar of events again, which I should take off. Um, so that's kind of, <laughs> that's just a lot. And I know it's a lot. You're going to have these documents to look at. You're probably going to have questions. Um, that is, that is my presentation. And I hope, I hope, if nothing else, the one thing, use the accessibility checker in any document you're using. Look under review. Um, you'll even notice, I've noticed in email, some, there's been a change where all of a sudden it's starting to tell me that there's an issue with accessibility in my email. Uh, there's changes, and you're going to keep saying that with the tools. They're going to keep progressing where they're going to be pointing out issues with um, accessibility. But um, please feel free to reach out to me and we'll turn it over to Q to Q&A and go from there. And I hope, I hope you got something from this. And I'm sorry if it felt like it was just so much information, but I just, I get excited about trying to train people on 508. Um, I think, good. I think you just need as much information and I probably gave you more. Your heads are probably floating right now, so. Well, and we'll transition everybody. This is a process. Um, this is not going to happen overnight, right. um, so we don't want to overwhelm anyone. But we do want to hit a few questions before we sign off for the afternoon, if you don't right. mind. Um, and one person asked if there was an example of a tag document to see what that looks like. And I did reply that we could provide an example of that. Sure. And uh, in, tra in a training when those pop up, Sarah Reed does um, a training in AgLearn. Um, I think Deb Sarabian and I took that earlier this year or last year. So when those pop up, I'll send those out to SPSD and RIAD if needed um, when they're available. Um, is, is alt text the same as figure descriptions? Um, ooh, I, I, yeah, I want to say it is. I'm just trying to think which tools kind of describe it like that. Um, most most tools are saying alt text now, but it is. I mean, it's that's what it's doing. It's describing what's the, what's in the figure. Um, yeah, some of that terminology that sounds like a little bit older terminology, but yes, it is. And what is a layout table referenced on slide eight? Um, I would have to go back and look at that layout table. I will probably have to re. I will have to add that to the. FAQs &A. to be, yeah, yes. the Q and A's. Yes. We will send, if we can't yeah. answer these today, I'll send out, we'll send out a document. And how do we gain access to your accessibility checker? Well, all and these. You kind of went over that in the last few Yeah, slides. the accessibility yeah. checkers that I'm primarily talking about are built into the tools. So you should have access. Mm -hmm. um, when you go in to create a new email, if you go up and like I said, look at the review tab. That's kind of where they seem to be putting all the accessibility checkers these days for all the tools is under the review tab and you will see it. You can have the accessibility checker open as you're creating the document. So as you you don't have to like wait till you get all done and then open it up, you can have it open. Some people like that, some people don't. It can be a little distracting sometimes to have it open, but you can have the accessibility checker open the whole time. Um, if you want Common Look Office, um, you can request that. We can I can provide you information on how to do that. I have a lot of licenses for all of these things, and I would be thrilled to get more people using more of the licenses. Um, the Common Look <laughs> Office is open for anyone. Common Look PDF, I am more restricted on licenses. I don't have as many of those, but depending on what your need is, um, we can definitely talk about it. And those are all, they all have to be requested um, through CC, but it's just a ticket. It's not a problem. It's not, they're not going to prohibit you from doing it. But yeah, they're they're available for everyone. We can definitely look into that yeah. and maybe 
maybe get together after this and look at common, you know, sites that you use for co color contrast too. So that way yes. we're using the same tools that you are beyond what's embedded in our Microsoft Office suite. Great. Um, that'll work. And how, if needed, are there protocols or guidelines to deconstruct a table into text for better um, audible conveyance? If you deconstruct no, it, you probably think. just have to rewrite it, maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's kind of two, there's two ways you can do it. You can leave a table, if you're creating a new document, you know, of course, you're going to try to create it the best way. But a lot of the older documents, what I've seen is if you go back and you look, you really have to kind of spend time with it and see if that table is explained down in the paragraph, maybe below it or above it, or somehow it is also explained, which some people have done. I've seen, you know, some people went in and when they created a document, I don't know I don't think they did it with the thought of 508 in their mind, but if you go through and if the if the same things that are in the table are described in the paragraph somehow, some way, and you're still getting the same message across, then you don't have to worry about the table. Mm -hmm. The table can be non-compliant. Now, I, I have to be careful saying that because I know because <laughs> they're going to say, well, you, it, things can't be non-compliant, but if you have described it, there are ways around things sometimes, mm -hmm. um, and it's not bad ways around them. It's just how it's identified. So in this case, if I went in through and, and ran it through my common look, and there's a table, and it comes up, and there, there's issues with it, and then I go down and look further down in the document, and they've, they've explained everything that was in that table, then even though it said it's not compliant, I can still pass that. Mm. Um, there are, I will tell you right now, 508 is not always black and white. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, it, and yeah, the, it, it's, it's complicated. Not. It's complicated. It, it is complicated. <laughs> it can be because I, I get that a lot of times. You use the tool, we got this issue, and then I have meetings with people and say, okay, show me how you're making this compliant even though I got this error. And if they can show me, then I can pass it even though it, it came out with an error. So and, I know that's not a good answer. I, people don't want to hear that gray area, but there really is gray area in 508. When in doubt, reach out. Um, there you go. <laughs> yes, always. Yeah, and you have the, the team here, uh, Christy Wiley, you have um, Deb Sarabian Standards, you have myself. Um, so any of us, you can always reach out. There's one question I want to get to before we run out of time and sure. we may not be able to hit the other ones, oh, but no. there were two yeah. questions that were similar. When you do cut or paste or copy or paste, when you paste to keep the text only, does that remove the code? The text, no. No, no. all right. I know that when the Drupal, when we did the website migration, if we did copy and paste into Notepad, does that remove the code? Uh, and then that, take what's in Notepad and then put it in your document. But that we one? have we have seen some issues around that, and I will okay. tell you, it's it doesn't to seem to it doesn't seem to be consistent, which is kind of the thing we've spent I've spent time okay. working with people trying to figure out exactly what is happening. Ah. Um, but that's when the doubt, problem. When in doubt, type it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, because, yeah. Out. That's good to know. Yeah. yeah. That is really good to know. Um, yeah. Do the headings need to always be numerical throughout the document, or does it make sense to use, for example, heading three throughout the document where the font is the same? Okay. So I'm sorry. Say that one one more time. <laughs> do the headings need to always be numerical throughout the document or does it make sense to use, for example, heading three? Like, I think the, what they're saying, can you use the same heading throughout the document, like using heading three yes. everywhere rather yes. than tearing down? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can. And there's a separate training um, that I think Sarah Reed does on headings that when those are available, I'll send out to everyone in, a, in an email blast. Um, question on figure descriptions. If referring to captions that are added below figures, photos, and documents, those are not the same thing as alt text, correct? It depends if what the description is. If it's a clear description, 
they can't they can be there's another one of those gray areas it would just depend on an individual situation they could possibly be yeah that's, especially yeah. if you're getting into meaningful alt text if you're trying to convey if right back to what you said if that image is you know very relevant and not um just descriptive then it would be a good idea to have your alt text match your captions you know and right. if you if it is conveying a very important meaning to the content of the document right uh, let's see there's one more here um someone wanted to repeat the cut the cut and paste really quickly about that not carrying the code or what about it carrying the code with it and messing things up well, it, what I'm saying is if you create it, if it was created and they didn't kind of follow some stand, some 508 standards when they created it, maybe they did mm -hmm. merge cells or they did merge cells mm -hmm. are not good. <laughs> they, they don't, yeah. they don't work with screen readers. So if, if you did that, you know, if you didn't use a good process of creating the original one, then when you copy it in, you're going to have that same issue. So you're going to have to correct it again. If you go mm -hmm. back to the initial piece that you correct it, that you created and you fix that one, then sure, cut and paste it as much as you want. But the thing is, people don't think to do that or they give it to somebody else, you know, in the group. Oh, well, here, use this piece, which is normal. I mean, we all do that. We're all trying to get things done as quickly as we can. So we're mm -hmm. trying to do it as quickly as we can. But if you cut and paste it, you're going to keep repeating those same errors. And some of them, like I said, if it's like a table and you've got merged cells, you're going to keep having merged cells. And those take a while to to clean up in um, 508. So you're just adding to your time. And that's kind of what we see more people emphasizing is my return on my effort. Am I spending a lot of time trying to do this or can I just go back and recreate it and use it again? So I'm not saying I'm just saying be cautious when you know what you're cut and pasting, I guess, is would be the best. Mm -hmm. The best wording for that is yeah. know what you're cutting. Don't just take anything from anybody <laughs> and yeah. start pasting it. <laughs> That's good advice. If, uh, one more question, and I think sure. we're, we're at the end. If alt text is the same as the caption, does the screen reader read it twice? Yeah, if you have the alt, yeah. If you have the alt text and you have the caption, yes, it is. It's going to read it twice. And that's not a bad thing. No, yeah, no, it's not. More, I mean, you're going to have that. Yeah, and it, it really yeah. kind of ties in with the, the fluidity of the document. Right, because mm -hmm. technically using the screen reader, they have commands using the screen reader where they could even be jumping around with their commands. They might not even read it. They could set it up not to read captions. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the screen readers are very, they have a lot of, of processing behind them. So um, it doesn't hurt for that kind of thing to be read twice. No. And we, um, and there was a question that kind of was getting ahead about um, resources for tagging. And I told this person to just reach out to you or, or myself and we can provide, you know, some training and some examples. They had some older documents in PDF form and uh, they, they don't have the original. Okay. And we spent, you know, a full eight hour day properly tagging a one page document <laughs> okay. and still didn't figure out the correct order. So I said, that's probably a, a one on one conversation right, right there to kind of work that yeah. out. That's a tough one. Yeah. Adobe, Adobe gives you the opportunity when you do the accessibility checker to tag documents. But I would tell you 90 percent of the time do not use that it will not tag correctly and you'll spend as much time trying to go back in. Actually, mm -hmm. that process I said of, of exporting that PDF to a word and then bringing it and then saving it, the word as a PDF again, will, I, I don't know how many times I've seen that work, that it, it takes mm -hmm. care of that tagging issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of that mystery behind the scenes that we don't get to see, but it, it does seem to resolve it. But yeah, tagging, we can, I can definitely, I've got, I think I've even got a separate uh, document on tagging because it's, it can be confusing. Okay. Yeah, just reach out to Karen or myself and we can get you more info on the tagging. Yep. And the same yep. with, and the same with complex tables. Um, I didn't publish this one. You know, there was a document, how to create, test and remediate PDFs. Uh, for section of 508 conformance using Adobe Pro DC discusses how to make complex tables accessible in the PDF. 
Um, yeah. Within SPSD, is it acceptable to have complex tables as long as the author makes certain the table is accessible? And I would say definitely so. Oh, yeah. yeah as long definitely. as you're, you're meeting that dog, you know, you have that document and it guides you. Uh, sure. And then, in, and again, like we said earlier with highly complex tables, when in doubt, reach out. You know, yeah. it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Yep. And just a, oh, another hint on tables, do not divide them, do not split them between pages. Screen mm -hmm. readers just really totally freak out when you do that. They don't understand what you've done. Um, so please, I've seen that in a lot of documents where they've got half a table on one page and half another. Now I realize sometimes tables are big enough they don't have a choice, but if you have a choice, please do not split them up. Well, it's right at 3.30. Uh, thank you so much, okay. everyone, for taking the time out today, and especially to Karen for putting together this presentation and helping us along this long road uh, that we're on to 508 compliance. And everyone keep a lookout on an email from me. I will send you the PowerPoint. Uh, Karen and I are gonna look at additional documentation and resources for you. We'll have links. I will also begin to send you stages of ag learn trading to get you deeper into this. Um, and we will talk to Karen and the Section 508 staff about deeper webinars to help inch everybody towards this road. It's continual. We're never going to be done. Um, this is, as Christy so so puts it so well, we're creating the muscle, muscle memory for everyone. It just becomes part of our daily work, especially, as Karen said, you go to the review tab. It's like doing spell check. And now you're doing spell check, grammar, and 508 compliance. So <laughs> it's all in one package. But yep. thank you so much today and reach out to me, Christy Wiley or Karen, uh, Paul Reich's here and so is Meredith. And just give us a, an email if you have any further questions and thank you for your time and have a great week. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bye -bye. Thanks everyone.